A good villain is just as important as a good hero. They test our heroes, they push them to their limits, but what makes a good villain? Today I'll be talking about Gravity Falls, Owl House, and Amphibia's villains. And to make this a little more interesting, I'll be ranking them based on a criteria I've made, so we can find out which show truly has the best villain. Here's my criteria. First will be character design and appearance. Then personality, motives, and beliefs. Then abilities and powers. Then we'll have presence throughout the show. Then we'll have their actions. We'll have effects on the protagonist. And finally, the villain's conclusion. Do they have a satisfying ending? I'll be rating each of these categories out of five and giving them a total score at the end. But with all that out of the way, let's jump into it. Starting with Owl House's big bad, Emperor Bellos. Bellos goes through many design changes as the Owl House progresses. In season one, we see him as a masked mysterious figure. Then in season two, he does a face reveal, giving us his second design. And finally, we have his final design. This form of Bellos is a twisted, mutated, and dying form that has to body swap to survive. Bellos' first design just screams villain. He's tall and imposing. His cloak and mask make him feel somewhat grand, which is fitting since he is an emperor. His mask does an excellent job at making him sinister, and the horns making his figure seem taller. That paired with the mask's dark void eyes alerts us straight away that this isn't a villain to mess around with. The outfit also hides a lot, making Bellos a more mysterious character. He feels far more threatening because we don't know what he's capable of. He could be anything or anyone, making him feel more like a dark presence than just a man. I think this outfit is excellent and extremely fitting for Bellos. Side note, I also think it's really funny that this design when struck in the face by Luce gets the sans eye. With Bellos' second design, my reaction to Bellos' face reveal was somewhat similar to Willow and Gus's reaction. It's alright, I like that the wound on his face foreshadows his next form. To save time, I'll just jump straight to Bellos' monster form because, let's be real, that's way cooler. Bellos has lived for hundreds of years, and he does it by consuming the souls of Magic Palisman. But consuming so much magic has changed Bellos. He hasn't been human for a very long time. Now he's a shape-shifting skeletal monster covered in eyes. This form at first seems powerful, as he uses it to lash out in anger, but the longer he uses it, the weaker he becomes. It drips and falls apart, sometimes having bones poke out, this is by far my favourite design for Bellos. I love how it looks like he's barely clinging on to life. He's a parasitic being. This allows him to constantly change, which leads to lots of interesting designs. This form perfectly shows us Bellos' slimy and dark personality. I'll give Bellos a 4 out of 5 for character design. Because unlike other characters on this list, he constantly changes and evolves as the story progresses, and all the designs show us different dark aspects of Bellos. Showing us he can be mysterious, calculating, grand, pathetic, desperate, and terrifying. One thing's for certain, Bellus got the drip. Unlike the other villains on this list, Bellus is a very serious villain. He's never playful or lighthearted. He's a villain through and through. This works in his favour for being a good villain. But unlike Bill or King Andreas, you don't really enjoy him as much. He definitely falls more into the category of loving to hate him. He's cold, manipulative, and calculating. Bellos takes every opportunity he can to manipulate people, and all his actions build to his master plan. Although he hides his plans, his motives are pretty straightforward. He wants to exterminate all witches, being brought up by witch hunters, and having his brother fall in love with a witch drove Bellos on a warpath against them. In his hundreds of years living amongst the witches, Bellos could never let go of his witch hunting ways, choosing to never grow or empathize with them. He only digs himself deeper into his own ideologies. Often Bellows tries to act like his motives are a lot deeper than they actually are. He also has a twisted view that he is the hero, but really all he is is a selfish murderer who's barely human anymore. So he's also a hypocrite. I'll overall give Bellows a 3 out of 5 for personality and motives. His motives are a bit bland, and his personality isn't larger than life like the others, but it is dark and fitting for a villain. Powers and abilities. Bellos may have started off as a human, but he definitely didn't end up that way. His body can now shapeshift, and he can possess others. Bellos also is the strongest witch on the Boiling Isles because of the Collector. The Collector taught Bellos the strongest spells and tricks of glyphs. In the final episode of the Owl House, Bellos is at his strongest. Bellos uses his powers of possession to take control of the Titan, the very island itself. In this form, he can create giant monster versions of himself, and if he had enough time, he would have possessed the whole island. He would basically be a god. So while Bellos is often weak and in a dying state, 
I'll give him a 4 out of 5 for power, but he has one more skill I didn't address, and that's his skilled ability to manipulate people. Belos is a master of deception. He's so good at it that he worked his way up to being the Emperor of the Boiling Isles. He even completely restructured the way the Boiling Isles works, getting his coven system put in place to restrain magic. And this leads us to the next criteria, presence. A good villain should have bearing on the story, and Belos definitely does. His actions and influences are felt in every aspect of the Owl House and the Boiling Isles. Belos appears in about 14 episodes. He's barely in season 1, but his influence is everywhere. Pretty much every major villain in the show works for the Emperor's Coven, meaning they work for Belos, so the threats still come from him. His total grasp on the Boiling Isles is felt everywhere, whether it's his henchmen or just the systems he's set in the schools and society. He impacts every aspect of the Owl House, which build him up as a threat. Having his presence from the beginning of the show gives him a one-up on Bill and King Andreas, whose existences are only made aware of later in the shows. I'll give Bellos a 5 out of 5 for presence. But with all this talk of how evil Bellos is, what actions does he do that's actually evil? While it's important to have an overall effect on the story, what evil acts does he do that's more personal and direct? Well, a lot of Bellos' actions are indirect. He normally does things in the shadows or orders someone else to fulfill them. But there are a few instances of him getting his hands dirty. Probably the most devastating one for the viewers was in the episode Thanks to Them. Bellos possesses Hunter and turns him against his friends. This would be bad enough, but at the end of this fight, Bellows kills Flapjack. This is by far the most impactful thing he does for the audience. It's brutal, shocking, and cruel, and gives us more reason to despise him. The next action isn't directly shown, but it's definitely one of the darkest things Bellows does. Believing his brother to be corrupted by witches, or just jealous of him, or maybe both, Bellows backstabs his brother, literally. After murdering him, he is set on a delusional crusade to kill all witches. But he still can't let his brother go, so over the years, Bellos tries to rebuild his brother by making Grimwalkers. These are basically clones Bellos built to resemble his brother, but he always deems them failures, so he murders them too. Bellos ends up doing this hundreds of times, maybe even thousands of times. This is just so twisted, it's so cruel and pointless, but he just keeps doing it. This gives us an interesting look into Bellos' twisted mind. He wants to create a brother that fits into his cruel world. One that's completely under his control, one that fits his worldview. These acts affect Hunter the most since he is one of those Grimwalkers. This leaves Hunter deeply traumatized and questioning who he even is. But now, let's move on to his evilest deed. After failing to kill all the witches with the draining spell, Bellos resorts to doing it himself by possessing the heart of the Titan. This causes him to become the Boiling Isles itself. This results in an epic final fight. Emperor Bellos definitely has a lot of dark deeds under his belt. And these are only the ones I thought were the darkest. But as mentioned, most of his actions are done in the shadows. He orchestrates events more than actually getting involved. For example, activating the draining spell. He kind of just f***s off after he starts it. So I'll only be giving Bellos a 2 out of 5 for actions. But there is one more action I'll address in the next segment. Effects on the protagonist. The most important part of a villain is how he affects our main protagonist. And boy does Bellos affect Luce, our main protagonist. After a time travel incident, you know how it is, Luce realizes that she accidentally helped Bellos gain his power. And man, does Luce feel guilt for this. It also doesn't help that Bellos loves to rub it in her face. You see, this is why you're so useful, Luce. You're so desperate to help people. You even help me meet the Collector. By season three, Luce is so filled with guilt that she starts to loathe herself and question if she's even a good person. Back in season one, Bellus also forces Luce to give up the portal to the human realm, separating her from her mum. Again, taking a massive toll on her mental health. Bellus turns sweet, innocent, bright-eyed Luce from season one to a guilt-driven emo in season three. None of the other villains so deeply affect their protagonists like Bellus does. But it's not exclusive to Luce. As previously mentioned, he equally scars Hunter, literally and emotionally. He controls Hunter's whole life. And then, when he finds out the truth about the Grimwalkers, he brings Hunter's life crashing down. He destroys his perspective on the world, kills his best friend, and even takes control of his body. Man, get this kid some therapy, please! And one final character Bellos affects is Ida. Now, while they don't clash directly, he has made a world that forces her to be an outlaw and turns her own sister into her enemy. So it's pretty safe to say that Bellos is very good at getting under people's skin. So I'll give him a 5 out of 5 for affecting our protagonists. And now that leaves us with his conclusion. 
Did Belos have a satisfying ending? Belos is an evil character through and through, with no redeeming qualities. He's had hundreds of years to get over his prejudice towards witches, but he never once chooses to see them as people. So the show never once tries to redeem him, even going out of its way to show there's no way he will ever be redeemed. I get it now. You just need kindness and forgiveness, huh? Huh? Luz, look! We can all be buddies now! Go in there! No! And that results in a very satisfying death. In his final moments, he tries to pretend he was cursed, trying to manipulate Luz, but he's shown his true colors too many times, no one is buying the act. He is pathetic in his final moments, and Luce doesn't even bother saying anything to him as the acid rain slowly melts him. And to cap it off, King Eater and Rain step on what's left of Belos. After everything Belos did, it's extremely satisfying seeing him finally get what he deserves. I'll give his death a 4 out of 5. So this gives Belos' final score a 27 out of 35 on the villain scale. King Andreas. Amphibia's Mighty Ruler. King Andreas's design is a good balance between an imposing, intimidating character and a jolly, fun-loving character. It's an impressive feat to balance these polar opposite traits. When Andreas wants to be intimidating, he can be. His towering size leads to some ominous shots. Unlike Emperor Bellos, Andreas's design never really changes throughout the seasons. Overall, while King Andreas' design is good and fills its role extremely well, I think Bellows consistently evolving and just straight up evil design is just a little better, so I'll give Andreas a 3 out of 5 for design. But what he lacks in design, he makes up for in personality, motives, and beliefs. When we are first introduced to Andreas, he is a happy-go-lucky bundle of laughs. He's a really enjoyable character who you can't help but like. But, of course, not as all as it seems. During the Season 2 final, True Colors, King Andreas reveals his true colors. He's a villain to not be messed with. While Andreas is revealing his dark deeds, he still has a playful edge to him, as he mocks our protagonists. But as the situation starts to get serious, so does he. He becomes more cold and serious. But the interesting thing about Andreas is that the persona he seems to put on before his reveal seems to be more true than he might realize. Even though he puts on the tough guy act, he actually does like having fun. And he does seem to actually care about Marcy. When Andreas first meets Marcy, he is genuinely enjoying her company. So if deep down Andreas was a good guy, what causes him to be a villain? Unlike Bellos, who's driven by his own twisted beliefs, Andreas was pushed and pressured into his villainous role. That mixed with a portrayal led him down this dark path. As a young Newt, Prince Andreas was in line to be the next ruler of Amphibia. But back then, Utopia wasn't a peaceful society. It was a society built on the invasion of other dimensions. His father was an extremely cold ruler who always pushed Andreas to be like him, trying to isolate him, push him away from his friends. After one of King Andreas' friends figures out that the magic music box will cause disaster, she steals the box to save everybody. But to Andreas, this seems like the ultimate betrayal. His closest friend stole the most important item to the kingdom, basically stealing his future making Andreas the biggest disappointment to his family in his father's eyes. This betrayal cuts Andreas deep. It also sets him on a mission to recover the box and restore Utopia to its previous glory, no matter what the cost. This mission would take a thousand years, Andreas getting lost in his mission, never trusting anyone again. Even after his father passes away, he is never truly free, since his father becomes part of the core, the true master villain manipulating everything. The core is a machine that is controlled by a mixture of Amphibia's greatest minds and leaders. And Andreas' father is part of it. The core constantly keeps an eye on Andreas and is always manipulating him and pushing him to serve its dark goals of conquest. Of all the villains on this list, Andreas is definitely the most complicated in terms of motivation and personality. So I'm going to give him a four out of five. He's definitely the least evil on this list, but he's complex and still does some horrendous things, but we will get to that later. Abilities. Unlike Bellos and Bill, Andreas never goes god mode on our protagonist. He saves that for the core, but that doesn't mean he doesn't have a sick final boss fight. Andreas has a cool mech suit he can use for fights, and man it results in a very cool anime styled fight that he nearly wins if it wasn't for his emotional baggage. But outside of his mech suit, he is still a mighty warrior. Bro even has a fucking lightsaber. Don't stop on my account. 
He's very strong, and that's because he's more machine now than man. Andreas has become a cyborg to keep him going over the hundreds of years he's been waiting to complete his mission. Andreas' most powerful weapon would be the laser on the flying castle. Nope, 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 nope. But other than that, Andreas doesn't really have any special abilities. He mostly uses his robot army and gadgets to be strong. That, and he's pretty good at manipulating and deceiving, getting our heroes to willingly hand him the music box. So overall, I'm gonna give Andreas a pretty low score in abilities, two out of five. But does King Andreas have good presence throughout the show? In season one, there's no mention or hint of Andreas. He appears in season two, but not instantly as a villain. So he's definitely around a bit in the second half of season two, but not as an evil force or presence. Then in season three, he's our primary threat. But even then, he's not really the main focus. Emperor Bellus feels very involved in everything in the Owl House, even when he's not directly there. This constant looming threat makes him feel more ominous and intimidating, but Andreas doesn't really have this. But Andreas is a very different kind of villain, and makes up for this in his actions. Overall, I'll give Andreas a 2 out of 5 for presence. Actions. What evil actions does Andreas directly do to be so evil? Unlike Bellos, Andreas is definitely more personal with his dark deeds. After his villain reveal, he doesn't hesitate to prove his villainy. He first throws Marcy under the bus by revealing her secrets to her friends to try and make them turn on her. Then, he uses his flying castle to destroy Toad Tower. So already that's a lot. He then tries to kill Polly, but instead successfully kills Frobo. And to top it off, he uses Sprig as a bargaining chip, only to still drop him out of a window in one of his coldest moments. But worst of all, is when he stabs Marcy. This moment is so dramatic. All of this happens in one episode. He very quickly establishes himself as the big bad. Andreas always leaps into battle, never holding back, always ready to show off his strength and fighting skills. And probably his darkest deed, after stabbing Marcy that is, is when he uses Marcy to be a host for the core. This scene is just so freaking messed up. <laughs> It's safe to say that Andreas has done some really horrible things, so I'll be giving him a solid 4 out of 5 for evil deeds. But how does he affect the protagonist? Emperor Bellos had a very clear psychological effect on Luce, but Andreas has a different effect on Anne. While Anne is obviously concerned about Andreas as the villain, she doesn't seem as personally angry at him. Andreas affects Anne by pushing her closer to her friends. When Andreas drops Sprig, Anne breaks down, taking in the shock of losing her best friend. While well, in the moment she uncontrollably unleashes her anger towards Andreas, the long-term effects of this push Anne towards being a protector. Her goals become more about protecting her friends, family, and Amphibia itself. It's not about beating Andreas, it's about saving what she loves. And Andreas helps push her in that direction unintentionally. So overall, I'll give Andreas a 3 out of 5 for effects on protagonist. It's not insanely huge, and it's not just him that pushes Anne to this point, but it definitely helps. Now, finally, Andreas' conclusion. How does his story end? Does he get what he deserves? Andreas has a huge battle with Anne. It's a pretty epic fight, but in the end, it's not Anne's powers that truly defeat him. It's his regrets, his past. This leaves Andreas open to Anne's final attack. In fact, he allows it to, in a way, sacrificing himself. But he doesn't die. Our heroes still have one final fight with the core. Andreas is called upon by the core to help, but in a moment that parallels Anne, Andreas stands up to the core. This is a great parallel to Anne's arc. What are you doing? Something I should have done a long time ago. Standing up to you! <gasps> you fool! You could have been immortal! What are you doing? Something I should have done a long time ago. Standing up to you! So Andreas gets somewhat of a redemption arc, but after all he's done, it's still not enough. Andreas will spend the rest of his days as a prisoner and a farmer, slowly helping heal the world he broke. He also doesn't get repaired, so age finally starts to catch up with him. While I like this ending, it's not as flashy as the other villain's endings. Andreas also gets sidelined for the core in the final battle. Plus, Andreas gets off pretty lightly, considering he stabbed Marcy. Other than that, 
A very solid ending, 3 out of 5. While Andrus is definitely a villain, there's definitely remnants of a good man in there. He's a more complex villain. His final score is 21 out of 35 on the villain scale. Now, that leaves us with one last villain for today's video. And there's a good chance if you're watching, this is probably your favourite villain, Bill Cipher. Now, let's just state the obvious in terms of character design. Bill is basic. Yeah, basic. It's a human insult. It's devastating. Despite the fact that even I can attempt to draw him with no art skills, his design is used in incredibly creative ways. Example, Bill's bow tie turning into a phone, or appearing as the moon, or growing extra limbs to punch more. Bill is just constantly changing and transforming. Despite being a triangle, he's very expressive. His shape is simple but iconic. This allows for plenty of striking imagery throughout the show. Sometimes less is more. I'll give Bill a 3 out of 5 for character design. To match his quirky appearance, Bill has an equally unique personality. Bill is a perfect balance of comedy and villainy. He treats everything like a game or a joke. He's constantly committing dark deeds with great joy. Oh wow, that's a great offer! How about instead I shuffle the functions of every hole in your face? <laughs> Bill is an agent of chaos, reveling in the destruction he causes. Bill is extremely entertaining to watch for multiple reasons. He's extremely unpredictable, he's funny, and he's cold and calculating. He's like Andrews in the way that his fun playful side draws us in, we always want to see what he'll do next. Bill's motives don't seem too deep at first glance. He wants to escape the nightmare realm so he can do whatever he wants, as put by himself. I'll remake a fun world, a better world! A party that never ends with a host that never dies! No more restrictions! No more laws! But there is probably more to Bill's motives than just partying. He seems to resent his old dimension and destroyed it. And with a little help from some extra Gravity Falls media and an axolotl, we find out that Bill may feel guilt and have regrets about his past. But that's kind of unclear. But it all just adds to Bill. The huge reason people love Bill is his mystery his mysterious past, his secret plans and plots. This combined with his fun personality and overpowered abilities makes him interesting and fun. I'll give Bill a 5 out of 5 for personality. Speaking of over-the-top powers, let's talk about Bill's powers and abilities. Bill is by a long shot the most powerful villain on this list. He's far more powerful than even Belos when he was in control of the Titan. Before Bill even escapes the Nightmare Realm, he's still pretty strong. While Bill is still trapped, he can still be summoned. While summoned, he can enter people's minds, dreams, and even possess people. These are already crazy powers, but when Bill enters our dimension, things get wild. Bill has control over space and matter, and after killing Time Baby, also time. He can manipulate all of reality with ease. He is a god, and a wacky one at that, doing wild and weird things. But paired with unlimited power is a sharp mind as well. Bill is cunning and manipulative. He also is patient, spending hundreds of years setting up his plan to escape. So, Bill easily gets a 5 out of 5 for powers and abilities. There's just no competition in this regard. Presence. Does Bill Cipher have good presence throughout Gravity Falls? Despite being the big bad, Bill only stars in 5 episodes and makes small appearances in 4 others. Bill doesn't even make his first appearance until the second last episode of Season 1. Most of Gravity Falls' overall arc builds up to the episode Not What He Seems. Bill's plot complements this and picks up after Not What He Seems, being the aftermath of these events. A lot of the show, Bill isn't the main villain. Even in his first appearance, he seems to be a henchman. In season two, he starts to show up a bit more, becoming a looming threat. But overall, he doesn't have the greatest presence. That is, until you consider, he sort of appears in every single episode, in the intro, he always appears in the beginning of every episode with a cryptic message, tying him to Gravity Falls' overarching mystery. So even though he wasn't directly in the show, in the beginning, he was constantly in the back of theorists' minds, giving a different kind of presence. Side note, Bill has spread his influence far outside Gravity Falls. Being such an iconic character, he's appeared in other shows, like Amphibia, Rick and Morty, and most directly in The Simpsons. But I am known by many names and take many forms. So with all that in mind, I'll give Bill a 3 out of 5 for overall presence. But how does Bill affect our protagonists? 
Arguably, the most important part of a villain is that they challenge the hero. Dipper and Mabel are challenged many times by Bill, and in most cases, he tries to divide the twins. But Bill's encounters only seem to help strengthen their bond. In Sock Opera, Mabel sacrifices her dream to save Dipper. In Weird Mageddon Part 2, Escape from Reality, Dipper and Mabel learn how much stronger they are together. They can face anything together. Bill seems to always unintentionally strengthen their bond. He is an excellent tool for their development. Bill also strengthens Stan and Ford's bond as well. He helps them find common ground. They're at each other's throats, but when Bill puts their grandkids in danger, they have to work together to stop him. But besides unintentionally strengthening the Pines family, Bill is great at making paranoia. His constant threat always nags at Ford. Bill's threat ends up pushing Ford to hide his journals, which is what kicks off the show to begin with. He drives Ford nearly to insanity. Have you come to steal my eyes? So while Bill doesn't have as drastic of an effect on the Pines twins as Bellos has on Luce, he still pushes our main characters to develop and grow as people, landing him as a solid 4 out of 5 in terms of effects on protagonists. Actions. Bill is a master of deception, but also isn't afraid to directly involve himself in a situation. Let's go through some of his most noteworthy evil deeds. He directly invades Stan's mind to steal secrets. He possesses Dipper, and let's just say he doesn't treat Dipper's body with the most respect. Boy, these arms are durable. I Bill also manipulates Ford into making a portal for him to cause an apocalypse. He then later causes that apocalypse, and he turns all of the town's people into a petrified throne of living people. Oh, and he f***ed up this guy's face, which is kind of just terrifying. He has a lot of evil moments. Bill also personally fights our heroes in a really cool mech fight. So while his actions aren't as shocking as Andrea stabbing Marcy, they definitely can be terrifying. Four out of five for evil actions. But how does the villain's story conclude? In my humble opinion, Bill easily has the best conclusion. Bill being a godlike entity would make it hard to defeat him in a way that would feel satisfying, and yet they did. Using pre-established mechanics, Stan and Ford trick Bill into entering Stan's mind. Stan has chosen to sacrifice himself by having his mind wiped while Bill is in there, killing him. The sacrifice itself is so emotional, but Bill's final moments are perfect. Bill begs Stan for his life. As the fire of the memory eraser closes in, Bill spazzes out in an amazing display of animation. Stan gets one final punch to finish him off. This is just so satisfying from a story perspective and an animation perspective and a character perspective. It even ties back to Bill's first appearance when he invaded Stan's mind. But in my opinion, the best bit about this conclusion is the mystery. Bill has always been very mysterious, so it makes sense that his death would hold one last mystery as well. As Bill freaks out, he says something strange. If you reverse the audio, we have Bill begging a different godlike entity to reincarnate him. There are many theories discussing this. Did Bill survive? Did he reincarnate? And if so, where is he now? It gives us one final mystery to keep Gravity Falls alive. And for that, I give his death a 5 out of 5. Am I being biased? Probably. But Bill is an incredibly iconic and memorable villain, and deserves all the praise he can get. His final villain score is 29 out of 35. So that puts King Andreas in 3rd place, with a total score of 21 out of 35. Emperor Bellos in 2nd, with a total score of 27 out of 35. And of course, Bill at first place with 29 out of 35. But despite the placement, all three villains are amazing and unique. They are designed perfectly for their unique stories, and I'm glad we got to see all three of them in action, doing their dastardly villain stuff. Thank you for watching this far into the video if you did. I really appreciate you taking the time to just watch. Also, sorry this video took so long to make, I appreciate everyone who voted in that poll. Also, let me know in the comments if you want a part 2, featuring the core, Gideon and the Collector. But, thank you for bearing with me. Catch you in the next one.